I think probably one of the scarier things that I ever did was deciding that I wasn't going to be spending thousands of dollars a month on the knot and wedding wire. Can I say those names on here? Yeah. <laughs> when people come to me for coaching consulting and they're like, you know, what's going on in the market right now? I'm like, listen, you need to always know what is in your geography. You need to know who's out there. You need to know what they're charging. We document and share best practices around owning, operating, and managing world-class wedding venues. All right. Here's a thank you so much for coming on the Venue RX. I am so excited to chat with you. And I have I think it's been a long time coming that we've had you on the show. Thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. I'm really, really excited. I've been watching you from afar. And um, like I was just telling you, like it's so inspiring for me to see people that have like this passion and excitement. And I've been doing this for almost 30 years. And so I long for people like you to like keep breathing that excitement and energy into this industry. We need it. So really excited and honored to be here today. Well, you're very kind. And I, I'm i excited to chat with you, not only because your experience, you know, we were just chatting before you said you've been doing this since you were 14. Uh, you're in North Carolina. Can you tell me um, about yourself quickly and then your venue? I'd love to hear because it's kind of an interesting you know, we have the venue owner series, but then also you're in the space kind of helping consult people at different points as well. So I, I want to hear about all the things, but I do want to dive into your venue a little bit and then talk about just your work in the industry as well. Absolutely. Um, my life is an open book, so I'm really excited, you know, to I have nothing that I learned that I'm not willing to share. And I think that that's something that is so really special and unique about our industry is that I think even since COVID, I've seen this beautiful outpouring of people that want to share their knowledge and experience and help everyone elevate what they're doing. So i um, really excited to share some of these things today. But I mean, we could probably talk for three or four hours. <laughs> we'll try to boil it down. But um, yeah, like um, like you said, my name's is I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I own a beautiful historic wedding venue. It was built in 1903. So it's a Queen Anne Victorian home. Um that was getting ready to be demolished in 2007. And we saw the sign outside of it. My mom is actually the one we call her the OG Joanna Gaines. <laughs> She's going to be 80 soon. And she saw that the house was going to be torn down. And her history and real passion is in historic restoration. And so that's kind of where our beginnings came was in the early 90s, where we did this same thing with an 1858 house. Um, so this venue that I own now, um, it is wildly successful, um, but not by accident. Um, but we had barn weddings before barns were popular. So we were doing that in the early nineties and, you know, we we're setting the trend for the barns. Um, but yeah, so we've owned this venue. Um, I've run it and actually for five years from Florida, which is crazy. I managed it. All of the leads came to me in Florida. I was um, managing the whole team. It was a crazy way to do it. What technology you could do it, though. But the phone calls came to me in my office, and I would come up to North Carolina for five years. And uh, when we decided to have a career change, we came up here, actually purchased a venue from my mom. She was planning to retire and um, then went and bought our fifth venue. <laughs> so we were like, that was not the plan. But um, so we've had five venues um, in my family and still have three. Um, but this one, I pay the mortgage on and I'm fully <laughs> running. So it's been pretty great. You touched on so many things there. I just like, we, I don't want to unpack them all. And like you said, I totally realized we could talk for three hours. So <laughs> the audience, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on podcast, I apologize. We, we probably have to have you back on tears that, and, and unpack them all. <laughs> This to kind of get a surface level understanding of kind of the timeline here. So you, your family originally bought the first property, renovated it, turned it into a venue. Is that, that, that was property number one? Yeah, that was my sister got married there. So um, that was the first historic home that we renovated as a family. So we were um, a homeschool family. So I only went to Christian school one year out of all and uh, it was my junior year. So we are a hardworking family. My mom actually is the real the pioneer in all of this. So we bought this house. My sister got married in 94 and my mom was like, oh my goodness, we're on to something here. And honestly, Jonathan, it, it exploded. It exploded. Within two years, 
we had renovated our barn and then um, we were having over a hundred weddings a year um, very, very quickly. And we honestly, we weren't prepared for it. And I know we might touch on this a little bit today. Like when people jump into this wedding industry, what are the things that surprise you, you know, that you just or totally unprepared for how hard it's going to be. Honestly, it's not all <laughs> sunshine and roses all the time. But we were renting out our bedrooms, Jonathan. Like I had a padlock on my my closet, so I put all my personal things away. We had B and B in all of our bedrooms. We were making all the food in our kitchen. Totally like, not appropriate at all. <laughs> but we were doing everything. Um, I, my mom, and actually this is a cool fun fact, but our family's been in the wedding industry for over a hundred years, which is crazy. So my great grandma was a wedding florist and she taught my mom how to do flowers. So my mom has owned a flower shop for years and years, has taught me a lot. So um, my great grandmother, my mom, me, um, and it's just been this, so I call myself a legacy wedding venue, you know, because we've been doing it for a long time. But so the OG, my brother still owns and operates that one is in St. Louis, Missouri. And um, yeah, we did everything ourselves, Jonathan. I mean, I learned how to um, cater. My mom's an incredible chef and we just did it all. And it was, um, I skipped childhood, let me just tell you. <laughs> but the first business I started, I was 15, 16 maybe. And my mom said, I want to start a bed and breakfast, but you need to start it. And so I did everything. I fielded the phone calls. I changed the room. I made breakfast. And that was the beginning of entrepreneurship for me when I started a and b at, you know, probably a little too young for some of the things I experienced. <laughs> that's, that's incredible, though. You, I think you, well, it was clearly in your blood, right? But then also you had those experiences. And being homeschooled, I, I share that experience. I um, was homeschooled all the way through till college yeah that's awesome and that's yeah similar thing i mean oldest of four grew up mm -hmm. raised in texas and um you you know you i think when you're homeschooled you have more opportunities to yeah. experience different things when you're younger because you're not spending you're maybe spending three four hours at school yeah. It's yeah. highly impacted. You're getting all the school done and then you're going out and you're doing other things. Like in your case, starting B&Bs, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so true. And I I honestly, I look at my kids and I'm like, did I, did they miss out on something? Because there's so many more opportunities that I feel like I had as a kid than my children do being gone for, you know, 10 hours a day at school and sports and all the things. But anyway, soapbox for another time. But um, it really taught me how to work hard. And we renovated that house fully. I mean, I remember one year for Christmas, my mom and dad bought my sister's chainsaws. And we, we would cut our own wood for a wood burning stove to heat our house. And when we first bought the venue, um, there was actually no running water and we had limited electricity. And there was a nine stall outhouse on the property. And that's literally what we used for a while. But we were, we came from very humble beginnings. I, um, I don't want to say that we were poor, but we did not have extra. And so what's so cool about our story is that we, we are that kind of American dream thing where we started from nothing. My dad was a minister and six kids and number five. Um, it just happened to be that all of this wedding stuff happened when I was at that prime age and the older four got married within six months of each other. They were gone. And then all of a sudden I'm the oldest. I'm with my mom and we're starting this business and um, we built it together and it was such hard work, but it um, I'm really grateful for it because it taught me just tenacity. It, um, it helped me learn that, um, that really great things could come on the other end of busting your tail. So I love working hard and um, never shy away from it. So help me help me understand. I heard St. Louis, Missouri. I heard you were in Florida managing the venue in. So put the pieces together for me and the audience. You said you you at one point managed five. You still own and operate three. I feel like I'm getting this wrong. No, you're good. So kind of the quick timeline of it is that the the OGs in St. Louis, my brother still owns that one that was in the 90s. And then uh, my mom sold that to him. He owns and operates that now. Then she moved to the next one, which is um, also in Missouri, is in Washington, Missouri. 
and um, built that one to be um, a really, really successful place. And um, in the midst of that, there was also one um, outside of Colorado Springs, Colorado. I had very little to do with that one. Um, And all of these really have been pioneered by my mom. Um, And the one here, uh, so then that was three. And then Charlotte is number four. And um, by far our most successful of all of them. This is the one I pay the mortgage on. And then number five is um, Dunkirk Manor, and that one is in uh, North Carolina as well. And that's the one that my mom was supposed to retire and couldn't quite let go of her entrepreneurial spirit. <laughs> so um, have really loved just um, coming and rescuing them several times with weddings. And um, it's a beautiful, beautiful space that they have. But um, I think that we're we're done for now. Wood. I think that <laughs> no more. Um, my mom has, um, moved to Virginia and bought a 150 acre farm and is hopefully not going to buy more venues. But, you know, when, when we bought this one, I remember sitting with my mom in the living room and we're people of faith. And I remember her telling me, cause you know, I've been on this journey with all of them. I felt, um, because we built this wedding thing together. I mean, when I was a teenager, I was at every wedding show with her. I was, I was a live mannequin at all of our shows and, you know, we built it together, right? So when um, I was in Florida and we came up one time and my mom told me um, she, they had renovated the house already and she said, Tirza, I think I want to open another venue. And I cried. I was like, mama, <laughs> please don't do this because I knew that I would be compelled to be a part of it with her because I I wanted it to be successful and I'm drawn to it for sure. Um, So we sat on the couch and we prayed and we said, God, if you would want us to do this, we have this little drawing and it was just not this one sheet of what we pictured could be on this land. It's only five acres. And she wanted to build a barn. And I said, let's pray and just see if God would give us 10. And he gave us 50. And we sold all of those with a picture of the barn and a hope and a prayer that it would be done. And um, it just built into something so quickly. Again, this was in, um, you know, 2010, 2011. Um, by 2013, we had 128 weddings in one year. And that's when I stopped and I was like, we need to raise our prices. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So um, so we raised our prices 20% and did less weddings and made more money. That's always the goal, right? So. Um, and we've only grown from there. So in 2016 is when I actually took over paying the mortgage, but not much changed except, you know, we were just trying to let my mom be released from the burden and kind of go on to do something different. But I I will tell you, this venue is one of the things, besides my children, of course, that I am most proud of in life. And um, I love it. I absolutely love it. But it's gotten much harder the last couple of years, for sure. So, and I want to, I want to ask about that because your story is incredible. You have <laughs> this experience in the industry that not many people I talk to do. Uh, you also are a part of a family business. What is clearly, like you said, a, a legacy kind of tenure in this, in this space and not just in the wedding and events industry, but kind of in the venue space, yep. Missouri, Colorado, North Carolina, you remotely operated it for a time. Do you you currently are in North Carolina, correct? Yes, yes. Our venue is in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we're actually just like less than five miles from Uptown Charlotte. Our venue. Got it. Do you live at the property, or do you live somewhere else, and then you kind of commute to the property? I promised my children I would never do that to the gym. <laughs> so we we do not. Uh, we had some people living there for us so that we didn't have to because I. I truly did not want my children to have to experience what I did, not having privacy. Yeah. So um, we live like 15 minutes away. Um, but yeah, we. it's much better. I think it's a much better boundary to not live where you work. Totally, 100%. And I, and I hear that from owner operators who live on property. I think yeah. it's a lot of times a stepping stone because when you have people that, you know, your backyard is the front yard of the venue and you see oh, people not re- giving it the respect that you want yes. shown yeah you know, beer cans cigarette butts the whole nine yards i know you oh, know right mm-hmm. 
So uh, help, let's. I want to. I want to dive into the family piece first because I'm curious. What was it like working with? your family, like so closely with your family, this industry is notorious for it, but was that a struggle at all um, in, in maybe difference of opinion, how you solved problems? Um, give me a little bit of perspective around that and maybe some, some safeguards or some things that you would yeah. warn people who are like, Hey, I'm going to go into business with my mom. This is going to be great. Right. Give, maybe give some, some of your uh, perspective as well as yeah. some helpful things that you've learned in the past couple of years. Jonathan, my mom is going to listen to this podcast. So hi, mom. <laughs> um, oh, no. Sorry, tears with mom. No, no, no. Okay. No, it's a great question. And it's something that um, it needs to be talked about, honestly. So there's different facets of it. So there is um, working with a spouse, which I actually feel like maybe someday, Jonathan, we should do a chat about specifically couples that run their venue together because this is a niche that is actually really unique, but there's a lot of husband-wife teams that work together. So let's stick a pin in that because I really feel that we need to circle back to that because that is a totally different conversation than what I will tell you with like working with family. But I think when it comes to, um, I, I think I could say this fairly and nicely, but there is a... Um, a difference between the way that someone would have done something um, 30 years ago compared to how they would do it now. And so the challenge that my mom and I faced is that um, she had so much more of that drive that was for the infrastructure and, um, you know, the restoration and all of that part of the business, you know, and I was so much more the people person and sales and marketing and Kind of the face of all of that and um sometimes those things there was clashes you know because i was thinking about the holistic picture of a client experience and maybe sometime my mom was thinking more so um about a bottom line you know and um and they weren't often as uh present at the venue and so you know when we were kind of in the weeds of building relationships with clients and um our team, you know, sometimes it was a little bit challenging when they would come in town and we would have a clash of opinions about things. And so, um, and I, I think that they would fairly, you know, they would agree with that as well. Um, and, and it wasn't just me. And so I do want to give a shout out to my sister and her husband. They left as missionaries in Ecuador to come to help them run the venue. And then my brother-in-law's brother came. So it was fully all family. And it was challenging because then I'm in Florida, I'm kind of managing their boots on the ground. Then we have the element of the parents kind of having their feedback. So to be really frank with you, um, in 2015, when we moved up here from Florida, I was working kind of face to face with my family and I almost lost it and I was really unhappy. And I was having a, it felt like a daily conflict coming in. And it just felt too hard for me. So I came into the office one day and I just, uh, I said, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I'm giving you my resignation. And um, that was a really challenging time for us as a family. And I think this is something that people need to understand. Like when you go into business with your family, there has to be respect and mutual um, understanding and of each other's roles. And that's kind of, I think, the most important thing that I would tell people listening is if you're going to work with family, it still needs to be professional. It still needs to have job descriptions and you still need to like let people do their jobs and not micromanage them. So uh, and that's difficult with a parent child relationship. Right. And one thing I've learned at like 44 years old is like it doesn't matter how old you are. Your parents always your parent. And there's always going to be that dynamic of parent child. And, you know, as a kid, you just like respect me, you know, like tell me I'm doing a good job. Like, tell me you're proud of me. It doesn't matter how old I am. I want you to pat me on the back and tell me I'm doing a good job. And um, and so my mom and I have a much more like professional relationship with each other because of doing business together so much in our life. So anyway, I cried. I quit. And then my mom came back to me and she was like, tears that I don't. I don't think that this is the path that you should take. We really want you to buy it. 
And I was like, heck no, I'm not doing that. Um, And she said, would you pray about it? And I said, I will, but here's the fleece. I'm going to think of a number that I'll buy it for. And you're going to think of a number. And in one week, we're going to come back together. And if it's the same exact number, I'll buy it. And well, we bought it. So that's exactly what happened. <laughs> oh. So anyway, wow. uh, I go on forever about that. But yeah, family is challenging, but there's also blessings. There's true blessings, um, especially now working with my husband. It's, it's truly remarkable that we get to build this life together. We're definitely going to have to have another podcast talking about uh, couples running venues together, doing businesses together in this industry. Um, I know I run our business, a couple different businesses with my wife. And, you know, I know you run uh, with your husband as well. So let's, we're going to have to do another podcast. We're going to have to do a few podcasts together. (laughs) I think so. (laughs) Awesome. I want to transition a little bit and just ask about the venues because you've mentioned, you know, um, the five venues that you've talked about across multiple states and, you know, you've been very successful. What has been, in your opinion, maybe the top two, maybe three things that have been keys to your success in in booking venues, booking the venues that you've managed out or owned? So I think it's really important to to change with the times. And I think that's one of the big things we kind of touched on earlier that was a challenge for me because, you know, this is the first venue that I physically have owned, right? And so that I could make make decisions that I want to make, right? But um, I think one of the things that I was noticing kind of in the beginning was, you know, you have to understand where your people are, right? So you have to really fundamentally understand, like when we first started, what was it in the 90s? You had to be in the top wedding magazines, right? Everyone was doing print. You had to be at every wedding show. Uh, We could do a whole podcast about wedding shows, by the way. Sidebar, I started my own wedding show in 2020 because I was so fed up with the way that they were doing things and I don't need to buy windows at a wedding show. But anyway, gosh darn it. Um, So in the beginning, you had to be in those spaces to be successful. You had to be at all the big label ones. You had to be at the little hotel ones. You had to be in all the main magazines and that's where it was at, right? Like we didn't, we had dial up internet. We didn't have social media. And so it was a very, very different thing that it is now. So um, I would say for us, our success has been, it's never accidental. And I think that, you know, in the beginning, it was a lot of um, throwing noodles at the wall and just seeing what sticks because we didn't have a network that's so beautiful that we have now, right? If you say you need a coach or a consultant, you could go like that and find, you know, 20 of them. (laughs) But um, I think what has been the most important thing for us is if I were to even boil it down to one thing, it's like knowing who our ideal client is and going after them and realizing we had a big epiphany that wedding shows were not where we found our ideal client. And we, um, it was such a relief the day that I told myself that we don't have to do that anymore. And um, I think probably one of the scarier things that I ever did was deciding that I wasn't going to be spending thousands of dollars a month on the Knot and Wedding Wire. Can I say those names on here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was a big deal because honestly, Jonathan, A lot of us in the venue space specifically are afraid to get away and do our own thing because you start a venue and if you're in any of these Facebook groups, you know, well, now the temperature is different about those brands, but it was always in the beginning. you got to market and wedding wire and the not. If you're not there, you're nobody. And we're spending thousands and thousands of dollars. So what, how do we now, like, this is a big question, um, this might blow your mind. I've been curious what's happening in the industry right now. How do you set yourself apart when it's so busy right now with venues? It's scary busy. And when we started our venue, busy there's no many more. Yeah, 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 yeah. Competition. I don't even like to call it that, but I it's noise to me. It's yeah. just noise. It's um, because I don't even, I don't look at other venues as competitive. Because I firmly believe there's enough fish in the sea, but 
it's harder, I think, for these clients now to kind of weed out, you know, the good ones. I don't mean to be rude, but like it's kind of hard. But I actually have our intern, my daughter, uh, working on a project right now where she's looking at a 30 mile radius of how many venues. There's a hundred more venues in the last 10 years in my city, 100. So when, when people come to me for coaching, consulting, and they're like, you know, what's going on in the market right now? I'm like, listen, you need to always know what is in your geography. You need to know who's out there. You need to know what they're charging. You need to, you know, it's not that I am not a really big proponent of secret shopping. I'm really not. I hate it when people do it to me and I always know they are. I'm like, just ask me, <laughs> you know, like I'm open book. But um, I think that's the challenge is like knowing who your people are that you want to work with. I have a venue owner friend that said, I'm a Michael Kors girl. If my if someone walks in the door and she's got her Michael Kors bag on her shoulder, I know that she's kind of hitting at the point, uh, my price point. And so I think it's a really fun way to think about it. We made a strategic move to start marketing towards busy professionals because we are fully all-inclusive. So again, that's a whole nother fourth podcast. All-inclusive venues compared to DIY, why have one or the other? I have chosen to go down the ro- route of um, all-inclusive because I'm all, <laughs> come on, we are entrepreneurs that make money. Can we just say that? So if I'm going to do all the work to get a client into my space and they're going to spend that money somewhere anywhere, anyway, it should come through me. And I should be making as much profit as possible. I'm sure I just offended someone saying that. Um, But I'm an entrepreneur. I want to be successful. Our venue brings in multiple seven figures. So we are really proud of that. But again, it's not by accident. I'm sure I digress here a little bit. But we made the strategic decision to stop paying these big label marketing companies because I wasn't seeing that they were bringing in the quality of leads that we wanted or even the number of leads that we were promised. And I decided to put my efforts into making sure that Google loved me with all their heart (laughs) and having a really great SEO person and someone that does copy for me and investing into people that had their um, that actually cared about my business. And and I wasn't pouring out money. Um, to me, I had no evidence that that money was going anywhere <laughs> and benefiting me. Yeah. How, how did you track that? Because I think that is the question so many venue owners have. I have had it at different points. It's like, okay, yes, I'm paying for the knot and wedding wire. I see leads coming in. I think that the leads hopefully are converting, but I don't know because I know that people, when they come and tour me at, you know, tour our property, they say, oh, I saw you guys on Wedding Wire, but then they also saw us on Instagram, but they also like filled out the form on the website. So, you know, whether you talk about last click attribution, about where they found you or like how much does Wedding Wire and the night actually play or or any of the platforms, right? Like this is just an yeah. online directory conversation. Um, how, yep. how did you determine that? So, yes. So uh, various different ways, but probably the one that I believed the most was the most old school way. I talked to people and I asked them, you know, in the moment I asked them um, and we tracked for probably, Jonathan, three plus years, we tracked where they came from but I didn't track it through like some um, graph that Wedding Wire would send to me because I didn't actually believe it. And um, that's a whole nother topic for when I got into argument with my rep in her pajamas from her apartment in New York City when I questioned her graph. (laughs) It was a lie. But anyway, so I kind of, I questioned the integrity of the person specifically that I was working with. And it really scared me because I'm like, you know, I am entrusting this big corporation and no one is going to care about my business as much as I do. And so every penny matters. And especially during the pandemic where we had to really not a single one of my employees lost a paycheck during that time. I sold my house. I moved into a condo. We were getting ready to build our dream home talk for another time, but like every penny mattered to me. And so 
I um I started asking our couples and one of the things that was the scariest for me to be honest is that probably 50% of the emails that I were was getting I never got a single response from anything and that felt very concerning because when people come organically to our website outside of that that doesn't happen they may say stop like I found my venue but they respond at some point somehow I don't really have anything like no one ghosts us at all. And so when we got rid of those leads, it cleaned up our process and we didn't have to dig through all of these, can we say potentially fake leads? I don't know. Yeah. So so I guess that, that's been a really good thing for us. I mean, we were probably booking through Wedding Wire probably less than five a year. And when you're booking 100 to 130, is that worth $1,000 a month? Mm -mm. So I came up with a different plan and we started um, selling alcohol and we sold enough alcohol in our first year. We got our permit to account for 30 weddings. So literally the profits of 30 weddings. And so that's where I just, my brain goes, you know, I'm like, you only have a certain amount of marketing dollars and where do you want to put that? We put it into SEO and Google ads. That's the only place I market is Google ads. And now we've been around for a long time. We have word of mouth, but um, I've chosen, I don't spend a single penny on anything outside of Google ads. Maybe some Facebook strategic ads from time to time. Just promoting different things. Yep. makes total sense. Tirza, yep. we are out of time for today. <laughs> you alluded to, I think we have at least four podcasts in our future. <laughs> <laughs> You, it's been so delightful to just get to know you a little bit here on on the show. And I hope the audience has as well. And if they haven't heard of you before and they're hearing about you for the first time, uh, I'm excited about that. Um, when If people want to connect with you, they listen to this, they want to connect with you. Um, you know, of course, we're going to have a part two, part three, part <laughs> four. <laughs> part, we're going to have a- additional parts that we add on to this, breaking down some of the things that you've you've. Um, kind of opened, right? The jar that we've opened on, on all these different topics. But if someone wants to touch base with you before that, reach out to you for for consulting or for anything else, what's the best place to get a hold of you? Yeah, just on my website, it's tearsacafe.com. Um, let me spell that for you because it is a tricky name. Um, it's T-I-R-Z-A-H, cafe, C-A-F-F-E-E.com. Um, and yeah, I'd be happy to connect with any of you. I'm one of the passions that I have is helping people not burn out, you know, that there's so many of us that are, you know, when we've been doing this as long as I have 30 years, most people don't make it as long as me. And so, um, I'd love to connect with you. I really, I love, again, like I said, I love what you're doing, Jonathan, because we have to bring some life and energy and passion and community into this venue owner space because we are the gatekeepers, friends. If you're listening to this, we are the gatekeepers as venue owners. It's a $70 billion industry that would not exist if it was not for you and me. And so it's important to keep having these conversations and honest conversations and saying some of the things that people are maybe a little afraid to say. I'm not afraid to say. I talked to a venue um, just a week ago and I told them, I don't think you should be doing this. (laughs) Like, I'm not sure. So I'll tell you, but Anyway, yeah, tearsofcaffee.com. Uh, it's been a pleasure being on with you today, Jonathan. It's been so much fun. We'll, we'll get on again real soon. Thanks for coming on. Bye.